So um, what we're going to be doing today is talking about how to teach inquiry remotely. So we are, you teach. Inquiry is in our DNA. It's what you've been taught to do since step one. But typically when we talk about inquiry, we talk about having the students in groups. We talk about, you know, working with them one-on-one, -on -one, talking with them, handing them manipulatives, all things that are going to be incredibly difficult this semester because um, you are going to be working remotely, at least at the beginning of the semester, and for many of you, quite possibly the entire semester. So you will not most likely be physically in the room with your students, at least at the beginning or at any point. So the question you might be having is, Mrs. Goldberg, can we even teach inquiry remotely? Is this even a thing? Is this even possible? And so hopefully by the end of the presentation, we will all have a resounding, yes, we can. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through four different strategies to help you get there. And the nice thing about these strategies is that they work well if you're going to be teaching remotely or if you're going to be teaching face to face. So if you do end up transitioning, you can still use these strategies. And when this pandemic is over, which it will be at some point, <laughs> and you go back to the classroom, these strategies will still work in both environments. So what we're going to talk about today is visuals, manipulatives, demos, and simulation. So let's get started. All right, so the first one is visuals. It is so important, I put it three times with exclamation points, visuals, visuals, visuals. If you have had me for step one, if you have had me for CI, you know that I have said you live and die by your visuals. If you have good visuals, your students will learn anything. If you have poor visuals or worse, no visuals, you might as well take that laptop and beat it against your head. It's not gonna be a pretty picture. So let's talk about how to incorporate visuals into your remote teaching. So the first thing that I have here is this is a lesson that we do in step one. Maybe you've done it. It's the sink and float lesson. Has anyone done this one before? You can raise your hand. So what we do for this one, if you haven't, is you get a little tub of water and a couple of objects and you stick them in the water and then you see which ones sink and which ones float. And then we give you these little cards. You can see examples of the cards on the screen and you have to um, put the cards, which one sink, which one float and figure out why. Why some of them sink and some of them floated. So a pretty basic lesson, pretty easy. The kids love it. It's messy. There's water. Um, but obviously, we cannot just hand you a tub of water. We cannot just hand you all these objects and say, hey, go for it. We can't hand you the little manipulative cards. So what I did here instead is uh, Mr. Sears actually created the results map. So this is the results. The objects on the top floated. The objects on the top sank. And he actually just put it on the map. And now, just like I'm doing for you right now, you would share your screen with the students and you would say, okay, look at this map. Look at this results map that I have right here. Now, whether you are using Google Meets, Zoom, or um, uh, what, what's the other one that everyone's gonna be using? Um, Microsoft. Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Teams. Um, most of you will probably be using Google Meets. Some of you might be using Microsoft Teams. All of them have a screen share option. So you will be able to use the screen share. A lot of the features that I am the most comfortable with are Zoom, just because that's the one I use and I've trained with. I doubt any of you are gonna have the ability to use Zoom. So I have modified this presentation to be more Google Meets standards because the majority of you will be using Google Meets. So therefore the, the modifications that I have made are for Google Meets. Okay, so, but you will still have the screen share option. So you're gonna share your screen, you're gonna show an image like this one, and then you are all going to, again, no matter what platform you have, Google Meets or Microsoft Teams, you will have the chat. And you tell your students in the chat, I'm gonna tell you right now, because it's gonna be interactive, so you do actually have to act like my students during this session so we can model how this is gonna look. In the chat, I want everybody to write down what do all the objects that sync have in common? And what do all the objects that floated have in common? So I'm going to use the annotate feature right now just to make this a little bit more obvious for you. You will not have that annotate feature if you are using Google Meets, at least not as of yet. That is not an option that they are offering 
at the moment, but what do all the objects that float, the ones in blue, have in common? You can see how well I can draw a circle, freestyle. And what do all the objects that sink in red have in common? Type it into the chat box, please. Okay, I see Dora saying about the dots being closer together or the further apart. Alicia's using the word particles. I'm seeing Araceli's using the word matter. I'm seeing molecules. So I'm seeing some interesting vocabulary here, matter, mar molecules, particles. So let's see. All right, so looks like people are entering their answers. That's good. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna call on a student and I'm gonna ask you, sorry about that, to unmute your microphone when I call on you and tell us about your answer, tell us what you wrote. So we're gonna go with Jasmine. Jasmine, can you please unmute your microphone and tell us what do all the objects that float have in common? That the particles are a lot further from each other. The particles are further from each other. When you say particles, what are you talking about? What are the particles? Walk me through this. The little like, stuff on the triangle. The stuff in the triangle. Specifically, what stuff in the triangle? The, the little dots that are there. The little dots that are there. Okay, so you're saying the little dots, these little particle dots, um, are further apart. And Isaac, if you had to guess, what would you say these dots represent? Could you unmute your microphone and tell us? The particles. The particles, okay. Can you give me another word for particles? Check the map. What word should we be using here? Matter. Matter, very good, matter. So you're saying, so to put Isaac's word and, oh, who did I call first? Um, Jasmine's words together. The matter is further apart in the um, objects that floated. And now I need somebody to tell me about the objects that sank. I'm gonna give this one to Vanessa. Vanessa, could you please unmute your microphone? Isaac, could you please mute yourself? And tell us about the objects that sank. What did you notice about their matter? Um, well, the matter's closer together. And... The matter is closer together. Okay, I got another question for everybody. Is there a difference in the amount of matter? Just based off this picture, just based off this picture, not drawn to scale, obviously, but based off this picture, is there a difference in the amount of matter? Think about it, think about it. All right, I'm seeing a lot of no's. I'm gonna call on somebody to explain why, why they're putting no, and I'm gonna call on Emilio. Emilio, could you please unmute your microphone and tell us why did you put no? Uh, well, because the map, uh, they all have, three dots of matter in it. So, so it's not the number of, of particles, it's not the, the amount of matter, it's what? What is the important thing here? Just their spacing. Just their spacing, how whether they're spaced far apart or close together. Excellent. So now what we're gonna do is I want you to type into the chat, what were some of the strategies that I used in order to get the students to the correct answer? So type in any strategy that you noticed that I used in that interaction. Type it into the chat, please. So I'm seeing Tamara's mentioning questioning. Myra added to that, I gave hints. So sometimes we weren't quite there, so I gave hints. How did I give those hints? What were some things I did to give those hints? I used follow-up questions. I used my cursor, right? Using those visuals. So I, you may not have the annotate feature, but you still have the mouse. So you can still use your cursor to circle things, things that they should be noticing. Um, building on questions, using follow-ups, using circles, using colors. I refer to the picture. Um, yes, reminding students to mute and unmute. So it wasn't just that they chatted in the chat box, they also talked verbally. So why would I want students to do both? Why would I want students to type in the chat box and talk verbally? And think about which one did I always have them do first? So type that into the chat box. Why would I always ask them to do both? And why do I always pick chat box first? Okay, so I've been saying so everyone can participate, so I have control in my classroom. It gives them time to think. 
All right, excellent, excellent points. Let's go with uh, Brianna. Brianna, can you unmute your microphone and talk to us about which one, oh, Brianna Martinez, which one should we be doing first and why is it important to do both? Um, I would say to do the chat first, just so you know that everyone's participating. And then once everyone, like you show that everyone had submitted an answer, then you can like call on a specific person. Excellent, great point. Just like in your classroom, if you just ask a question to the whole class, how many students are gonna get a chance to participate? Who's gonna no, be- Everyone's gonna to try to talk over everyone. Every, either everyone's gonna to try to talk over everyone or what's, what else is gonna happen? How many students are gonna answer? Like two of the smart kids that always answer are gonna answer. That kid, it's gonna be that kid, right? Whether it's virtual or face-to-face, -face, that does not change. So either they're all gonna be talking over each other or you're gonna have that one student who always answers and everyone else is like, all right, we'll just wait for JB. He'll give the answer eventually. Then we can go back to checking our phones. You know, so same principle applies here. You want to give the chat so it's sort of this democratic, everybody gets a chance to answer and think about it. And then you want to call on students specifically to talk. I could just have you chat. I could, there's some great answers in this chat, but why would I also want to give the students the opportunity to talk, to verbalize? So think Please. about that. I think we still need that social interaction also, so it kind of keeps everybody engaged, we hear our voices and it makes it real, I think. Absolutely, so yeah, you know, the chat is very disconnected, it's very dispassionate. So you also have that opportunity to hear each other's voices, to engage, um, to have more of that real like classroom live setting. But there's also another reason why I might wanna be calling on sp very specific students when I'm having this conversation. So remember, I'm monitoring the chat. And I can see which students get the answers right. I can also see which students get the answers wrong. So I might want to call in a student who got the right answer. That would be great. They can share that correct answer with the entire class. But I want you to think for a second. Nobody answered yet. Just think for a second. Why might I also want to call on a student who got the answer wrong? Don't answer yet. I'm going to call on someone. Think, think, think. Why might I want to call on somebody who got the answer wrong? Okay, I'm gonna give this one to uh, Maria. Maria, can you please unmute your microphone and tell us why might that be a good thing? Um, because you want to see where did they, where did they have a misunderstanding, and not only that, because uh, that could, that person could not only be the only one that's not getting it, so that way you can clear the space and like help other students as well and you want to see like why did they get it wrong where is their reasoning and stuff like that absolutely beautiful Marie. She, she got it right we find those misconceptions and we address those misconceptions and i love how she said that might not be the only student who's having those misconceptions so again the beauty of the chat is you can see who got the right answer but you can also see who's not quite there and then you can sort of address that with the class and you know make sure that everybody's getting those right answers and seeing where those misconceptions are coming from beautiful so this is our first example and this has one image and this is an image that Mr. Sears made now I'm going to give you a second example and this example, oh, so this is something with Zoom. When you use the annotate feature in Zoom, you do have to um, clear the screen because it's keyed to the, the screen, not the slide. So I'm gonna clear all my drawings. There we go. All right, looking good. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this biology example. And this time the images that I'm using are from Google. You are welcome to use Google. Just make sure you cite where you got the images from. Um, and in fact, when you're teaching remotely, um, that's sort of the beauty of it. If you don't have the image you need or the right image, you can just do a quick Google search and pull up the one you need. So here I have two images. This is a lesson about DNA. And we're gonna talk about why I have two images in just a second, because sometimes one image isn't gonna cut it. So my question for the class is which bases bond together and why? So the reason why I have two images here is because I can answer only one of these questions. 
with this one image. So one thing that I notice is that people tend to think, okay, I got one image up there, I'm good. But sometimes that's not gonna be good. You're gonna need to have two or three or four images to get the students to the correct answer. So let's use this one to see what that's gonna look like. So right now, what I want you to do is ignore the image on the right. You can't see it, it disappeared. Ooh, gone. All right, so we're only looking at this image on the left. And we're going to answer just the first part of this question. Which bases bond together? Don't worry about the why, just which bases bond together? Type in into the chat box, please. Okay, I'm seeing A, T, C, G, but I've seen Yaritzi is saying what those words mean. So there is a key down here, adenine with thymine and cytosine with guanine. There seems to be a good consensus on that. So here's my next question for you. Is there ever a time, ever, where adenine bonds to cytosine? Look at the picture. Is there ever a time where adenine bonds to cytosine? Araceli, can you please unmute your mic and tell the class what you think? Um, I think that it's not possible because the shapes wouldn't fit together. The shapes wouldn't fit together. Can you elaborate what you mean only using this image to explain that? Okay, so adenine kind of has like an arrow. Okay. And cytosine is kind of a circle. Okay, cytosine is kind of a circle. So she's sort of looking at that image, looking at those shapes. So she's noticing that adenine always binds to thymine, but it doesn't really bind to cytosine. And she has maybe a Y, which is something about these shapes. But can we truly answer the why with this image alone? Can we truly answer why this is a triangle and this is a circle? I mean, it could just be the artist drew it that way. Is it really a, lot, a, a triangle and a circle? If I were to look at a real DNA molecule, is that actually what it looks like? Yeah, and I'm saying no, no, that is not the case. So this would be one of those situations where this first picture is great for answering that first question. I mean, you all got it, right? Danny and thymine, cytosine, guanine, boom. But answering that second question really can't be done very well with this image. So that's where I'm gonna bring back this second image. And now I want you to look at this one right here. And don't type in yet. I have a special instruction for you. Don't type it in yet. You're gonna answer that question of the why. Why does a Denny bond to thymine? Why does cytosine bond to guanine? But here's my special instruction. So like I said, do not type it in yet. What we're gonna do is we're gonna do um, what's called a private chat. Now on Zoom, this is super easy. You would just select to chat with me. You cannot do that with, um, whatchamacallit, um, with uh, Google Meets. And I'm not sure if you can do it in Teams. I haven't tried it out. So I have two workarounds for the private chat. And we're gonna try both. And I'm gonna warn you, I have not tried this before with a live studio audience. So we're gonna see if this works. And we're gonna try both and we're gonna see which one works better. And then you can take that with you when you go teach. The first one is poll everywhere. So I put the link in here into the chat. I want everyone to click that link. And what you're gonna do is you are going to type your answer not in this chat feature, but you're gonna type it in the poll everywhere. So I want everyone to click that poll everywhere link that is in the chat. When you have it, just you know, give the little thumbs up symbol. I'm gonna go back to the original picture so you can see that again. And in the poll everywhere, I want you to type your answer. So not in my chat box, in the poll everywhere. Please type your answer. Uh, do we enter your names? Yes, please enter your name. I do wanna know who is making which responses. Excellent question, Eric. Yes, you would want your students to enter their names so you, you can keep track of who's saying what. Okay, so I'm gonna give everybody about a minute or two to see if they can figure that out. Oh, great question, Eric. So um, let me type the question in the chat box. This is also another good practice you should do is type the question. So in case they forget what you were asking. So the question is, why does adenine only bond to thymine? Why does it never bond to cytosine? Why does it never bond to guanine? Why does cytosine only bond to guanine? 
again, why does it never bond to a denim? What is going on? And here's your hint. It has, there's something about this picture. And I would recommend looking in the middle. There's something very special in the middle. If you have a question, you can type it into the chat or unmute your microphone. If you need a little hint or a little help. I need a little hint. All right, you need a little hint. Here comes your little hint. I want you to look right here. And I want you to look right here. And I want you to compare them. So I want you to look here. And I want you to look here. And I want you to see what's different. What's different about this adenine and thymine? And what's different about this cytosine and guanine? When you think you have the answer, I want you to type it into the poll area. All right, I am gonna have to exit there because I wanna show you what the poll everywhere looks like. Um, so I can take this box off for right now so you can keep looking at that while I go pull up the poll everywhere. That is one of the, the features is that when you have to exit the full screen PowerPoint um, to move to a different screen. All right. So are we responding? Okay, I see, I'm seeing some responses. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to show you what my poll everywhere looks like at this point. So I'm gonna switch over. There we go. So now at this point, you should be looking here. Now I'm seeing responses come in. And I'm seeing, okay, cytosine and guanine have three hydrogen bonds. There's a different amount of hydrogen bonds things of that nature. And only I can see this. You can't see this, but I can see this. So as the students are responding, these answers are coming in just to me. So now I can call on somebody and ask them to explain what their answer is. And for those of you who are dying to know, I will call on somebody to explain what their answer is. Um, so I'm going to call on, um, Roberto, Roberto, could you please tell us what is the answer? I'm gonna switch over to the other screen. Why does cytosine only bond to guanine and why does thymine only bond to adenine? Well, adenine and thymine have two bonds connecting them. And, and what do you mean by bonds? Tell me, tell me where these bonds are. Uh, right between adenine and thymine. Okay, so like the, the solid lines or the dotted lines? Which ones are the we? The dotted talking? lines. The, the dotted lines. Okay, so we have these two bonds, these dotted lines between adenine and thymine. And what about cytosine and guanine? They have three bonds connecting them. They have three bonds connecting them. So if I put an adenine with a cytosine, what would happen? Uh, they wouldn't match. Why not? Because they require a different number of bonds to connect. Exactly. Other. You'd have that, that bond sort of hanging off that wouldn't have a spot. So that's why adenine has to go with thymine because of the two bonds and cytosine has to go to with guanine because of three bonds. Would I be able to figure that out from this first image? No. No. So I want everybody to now type into the normal chat. So go back to your normal chat. Why did I bother giving you two images? You could have just figured it out with this one image. This one image actually gives you both answers. Why did I take the time to show two images in this situation? Scaffolding, okay. Help build understanding, scaffolding. And Francesca, a lot of people are typing scaffolding. Could you please elaborate what you mean by scaffolding? Uh, yes, so you use the first picture to kind of get their like knowledge going to see you know what they could see from it and then you wanted to help them get a clear understanding so you built upon what they had already stated using the first picture just in a little more complex one using the second if i had started with the second picture you're a freshman biology student never studied dna before what would be your attitude if i started with this second picture <laughs> I would have been horrified. <laughs> and I would have been reluctant. Yeah, I would have been reluctant to share because I, I, it looks a lot more complex than the first one. Absolutely, yeah. So what we're doing here is, is we're starting with a nice, easy, simple, hey, blue goes with yellow, green goes with red. Everyone could do that, right? And then we sort of build up to the more complex picture, the one where we're actually looking at bonding and we're kind of building more of that, that knowledge base. So absolutely, start with an easy, easy picture 
and then build to a harder, 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 adding that knowledge. So again, sometimes one picture is not gonna be enough. Sometimes you're gonna need two or three or four. Now, let's go back to why I did that private chat. So I want everyone to, again, look at my private chat over here. And even though you, I asked you to put your names, it's not showing up. I need to work with Poll Everywhere. I'm not the best at it. I'm just starting to use it. So I will play around with this. But what would be the advantage of having um, the, the students private chat with me instead of having everybody do the chat where everybody can see their answers? What's going to be the advantage of sometimes I want to use the private chat instead of the general chat? I'm going to give everyone a, a minute or two to think about that, type it into the, to the chat box. Why would I want to do a private chat instead of a general chat? Actually, you know what? Don't type it into the chat box. Here's, we're going to try our second one. So I want everybody to go pull up the, um, whoops, this is the wrong thing. Um, I want you to pull up your Google Classroom that I provided you. Go to that link with the Google Classroom. Now, almost all of you will have access to Google Classroom. I think that's going to be used by most districts. Like Miss Elise said, they might be tra uh, transitioning in McAllen to Canvas. But at the moment, I think almost everyone's using Google Classrooms. And I want you to go to Google Classrooms and I want you to click Classroom. Um, and again, this is my view. I, I don't know if your view looks different. I'm new to Google Classroom. And I want you to click the private chat. And I want you to open up the private chat. And I want you to, so I have all my students here. And I want you to answer that question in the Google Classroom under private chat. Let's see if this works. Again, I have no idea if this can work. This is the first time I'm trying it live. So we'll see how it comes. So I want everyone to do that. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to repeat and type in the question, why would I want to do a private chat? There's your question. Why would I want to do a private chat? This time, please use the Google Classroom instead of the poll everywhere and we'll see how well this works. Ms. Goldberg, do you know where we write or type our answer? Because there's three. There's one that says class comments, there's one that says private comments, and then the other one says your answer. So I'm, I mean. Uh, probably the one that says your answer, I would imagine. Eric, you already turned yours in. I can see it. Which one did you use, Eric Garcia? Uh, the, your answer one. Okay, yes. Please use your answer. Mrs. Goldberg, I also want to point to my comment in the Zoom chat. Just Absolutely, please do. Above, um, about the high expectations you had that I liked about your DNA base pairing example. Because um, with the right images and teacher preparation, students, even in regular biology that hate biology or that are struggling, can totally understand the reason why adenine pairs with thymine and why guanine pairs with cytosine instead of just thinking, eh, that's what my teacher said, so I'll memorize it. And I guess that's true because that's what she said. They can figure it out. I love it. Absolutely. I, I cannot stand when teachers say, adenine bears with thymine and guanine pairs with cytosine. It's like, no, let them tell you that. That's like the easiest thing they can figure out in biology because they can literally see it. Like it's right there. Don't tell them, let them tell you. And like I said, to get to the why is complicated. You know, that's not an obvious, but with the right images, they can totally get there. All right, so I'm noticing some people are answering in the poll everywhere instead of the Google Classroom. So I'm just gonna reiterate, please answer in the Google Classroom, not the poll everywhere. For the sake of time, because we're already at 10.33, I'm gonna call on some students to answer, but um, why they think the private chat is gonna be uh, beneficial. And then I'm gonna show you what my private chat looks like so you could see what this would look like as the teacher. So I'm gonna go look at my responses from the private chat and I am going to call on Brandon because I, I like his answer and I want him to share that. So Brandon, can you please unmute your microphone and tell us why, why would you think using the private chat might be a good idea? Okay. So I think that it's a good idea to use the private chat because uh, it, it'll be, it'll increase like the participation of the students. 
um, by them not being able or not having to worry about others, you know, what others are going to think about their answer. Like it's only going to be directed to the instructor and the students won't, won't be, you know, worried about answering wrong or, you know, other students being able to see their answer basically. Absolutely. Just like a student would be shy to answer in front of their classmates in a face-to-face -face classroom, they might be shy to answer in the chat box. I had one student who typed, you know, maybe they're a little bit iffy. Maybe they're like, oh, I don't know, is that the right answer? I don't want to look stupid in front of my classmates. But with the private chat, it gives them the ability to answer where only the teacher is seeing it. So it really takes down the pressure. It's like, yeah, I might get it right, I might get it wrong, but nobody has to know except for my professor, or I, in your case, except for my teacher. I have, I have a question. Sure. So I know that, so I am a little bit familiar with Zoom. I know that once you exit the meeting, um, the chat, you, you know, you can re refer back to the chat and actually see who, who's been participating during the, the actual meeting and stuff. But when it comes to that private chat link that you sent, are you able to like go back and see like the the responses? You Would know, you like maybe to, to get it? an idea of who's Yeah, let's all look yes, at it. Yes, yes. Yeah, let's 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 look at this private chat. Oh my god, I just violated your trust. I'm showing you everyone's answers. But that's okay because you know this is a training. So what we have here is this is what I see. And this is really cool because I can see exactly who answered and I can see what they responded. Now, right now, I just have this as a generic private chat. You're gonna keep using this throughout the entire training. You might wanna actually have specific questions that you can um, ask, so that way you can keep a track of, here's how these students answer question A. Here's how these students answer question B. Um, or you might just wanna have a box that's just private chat. And anytime a student wants to private chat with you, they just stick something in that box. You know, you could, you could have that flexibility. Um, or you could say, you know, the DNA lesson, label it DNA lesson, and then these are all the chats from the DNA lesson. So I have a record of what students, and I also have a record of which students didn't answer. So I know, uh-oh, Jeanette didn't answer. So I can say, Jeanette, don't forget to answer this question. You know, so it's, it's easy for you to keep track of the students. So um, what Brandon said is absolutely correct. Um, you know, it takes away a lot of the pressure for students to feel like they have to get it right. So it increases participation. But another thing I want you to think about is what if I'm a student and English isn't my first language? What if I'm still learning English? How is the private chat gonna be really beneficial for me? Now, you don't have to type it. I'll let somebody unmute your mic and share. Why would that be a really good thing if I'm a, a student who's a slow typer or who's new to English or who's not very confident? in my English skills. Their spelling. Spelling. How many students are just not going to participate because they're worried about spelling something wrong? And they're going to say, oh, I'm going to look so stupid in front of my friends. I don't know how to spell, you know, a Denny. <laughs> so again, it, it lowers the pressure on these kids. It gives them the opportunity, this very safe space to try to attempt and it gives you as the teacher insight into what they're thinking. Let's go back to that misconception thing. Again, why is the private chat going to be really great for these misconceptions? I can find misconceptions in the public chat, but why is it going to even be better if I use the private chat? Uh, like a one-to-one. -one. Okay, so I could do a one-to-one. -one. I could do a private response, right? Mm -hmm. Where I just respond to that student if they have a misconception. How else can I take their misconception and use it for the whole class? You can also modify what you're, how you're teaching it or what you've been mentioning to see. Maybe if you as a teacher said something wrong, you can actually go back and, and change that. Yeah, absolutely. So you can be like, oops, I goofed. I said that incorrect. Or you can point out a misconception, but nobody needs to know who made it. So you can say, okay, so I'm seeing somebody says that, you know, it has to do with the backbone. The, the backbone is the reason why a genine only bonds to cytosine. All right, let's look at that backbone. Let's see what happened. I don't have to be like, Crystal said it wrong. You know, nobody needs to know who got that wrong. Only me, only the teacher. I can get it wrong. I can be like, so students, is it the backbone? What do you think? And they could correct me. So again, it gives them that safe space to get things wrong 
without that fear of looking um, foolish in front of their, their classmates. So I would highly recommend doing the private chat in concert with the public chat. Sometimes you're going to want the public chat. When do you want the public chat? When, when would that be a good idea? When would it be a good idea to have the public chat versus the private chat? Because you're going to want both. But when would you want the public versus the private? I'm going to give that I'm one give to Emilio. Emilio, unmute your mic. Tell us. When would you want a private chat versus a public chat? A private versus a public? Mm-hmm. And what uh, kind of questions would be good for a private chat and what kind of questions would be good for a public chat? So like for a public chat, you can use it like to kind of gauge everybody's understanding. Uh, and I guess you could use it either or for private or public. Mm -hmm. uh, right, so it's for both. But uh, with the private one, uh, you can, as people say, you can follow up and under, uh, like specifically ask a student without alerting all the other students that, hey, this person wasn't able to understand it. And you can Absolutely. find out from them how, like where their misunderstanding is coming from. Absolutely, I got a second question for you. If I had an easy question or a hard question, which one would be better for the public and which one would be better for the private? Easy would be better for public or private, hard would be better for public or private? Easy would be better for public. And Why hard public? Would be, uh, because if it's an easy question and you feel confident within your students that it should be a, either a, a, an easy answer, then they'll all uh, either get it right or it can be an easy uh, discussion. With a hard right. question, they need to think about it and they might feel discouraged with their answer whether or not they're going to get it right. And so that's why you want to go private so that way you know, they can safely submit it. Absolutely. So notice, I used the public chat when we were doing the nice easy peasy, which one bonds to which, and I used the private chat when we got to that harder one because I wanted to give the students the safe space to try to figure it out without the intimidation factor of the public chat. So just like you wanna use different images and build on the images, you also wanna use different chats to build on, you know, what they can do, feel safe doing with everybody and what's gonna be a little bit better when, they're, when it gets, the material's getting a little bit harder, a little bit more complex. All Mr. right. Goldberg, Eric Garcia mentions he has a question for you. Okay, Eric, go for it. I had a question. I know uh, you mentioned how, uh, like, we have EL kids in our classes, and we can use the the private feature. Like, is there any other features that we can use to help them? Because I I know it's like this has all been in English. Like, is that going to be on their their end to do that, or, or? So, so are you asking? Can you translate the material? Is is that what you're saying? Not, not translate, but like we have like you know we have like dictionaries at, at in the classrooms. We have other um, stuff that they can use. But like, how would that, how could we incorporate those stuff here and like during the lesson? Okay, awesome. So can you use those resources in a remote environment? Absolutely. And I would highly encourage that. So one thing is that you can do, um, you know, bilingual um, instruction. You can have instructions in English and in Spanish. Um, when you are producing these things. You can also use, take advantage of the Google Translate or let them take advantage of Google Translate or whatever, you know, it doesn't have to be Google, but to whatever service that they wanna use where they can translate things. And I'm pretty sure within Google Classroom, and again, I'm new to Google Classroom, I have to play with it a little bit more, but I think there actually is a translate button and so you can um, actually translate materials for students, I believe, within the platform. But again, I am, I am new to the platform, so I don't know where that is. <laughs> so you would have to bear with me while I, I try to find that. But I believe that is an option. And, and I'm glad you made that comment because um, you know that is gonna be the reality. You're gonna have a lot of students who they themselves may or may not be comfortable with English. But remember, if their parents are helping them with their assignments, they may not be comfortable with the English. My daughter is starting pre-K and all the assignments are bilingual, not so much for the students, but for the parents who are gonna be walking them through the materials. So I would highly recommend taking advantage of you know, using the bilinguals, not just for your students, but for the, any parent who is attempting to assist the students in their learning. Um, so that way the material is comfortable for both them and whoever is assisting them at home. Mrs. Goldberg, I wanted to add real quick for everybody because that was a great question, Eric. Next week you all can start 
communicating with your cooperating teacher about that because schools usually have a plan in place and very specific guidelines and resources that they want students that are English language learners to be using. So even if you have your own great ideas that you think would work well, you should definitely have that conversation with your cooperating teacher because even in high school, students that are learning English that are at the beginning and intermediate levels are required to take a state assessment called the TELPAS, an English language proficiency test, um, so they can help guide you towards what they need you to do or what they want you to do when you're working with any level of English language learner. And then I wanted to add one more thing, which is that I also love the private chat feature, um, like in Google Classroom, like we just did, because one of your duties and jobs that you could offer to your cooperating teacher is you can be like, look, is it okay if I help monitor um, all the responses in the chat and I can help find responses that maybe aren't correct from students? And so you might offer to like make a list of the students in third period that seem to be struggling because you notice that their answers are just not right, but the teacher might miss it because she's also, or he's also teaching at the same time synchronously. So that's a great benefit is that you can actually see and have a record of everyone's understanding, whether it's right or not. And then maybe those become the students that you offer to follow up with in some kind of smaller group tutoring session later. Sometimes we miss students' responses in the middle of teaching, but now you actually have that in a written way that you can look at later. Um, and so you should totally offer to your cooperating teacher, is it okay if I help you identify students that are struggling? And then you can offer to tutor them if that's what your teacher wants. Excellent suggestion, Mr. Sears. Really appreciate that. Okay, so going back to the private chat, I showed you two features, Poll Everywhere or Google Classroom. Uh, both of them work. Having seen both live now, I would probably suggest the Google Classroom. I think that one's a little bit easier to use also because you can see which students responded, but two, two good features you can use for the private chat. All right, so we're going to move, unless there's other questions. If there are, that's totally cool. Feel free to ask. Okay, we're gonna move on to another one that I wanna talk about, which is annotate. Okay, so here is a math example. So all my math majors, I didn't forget about you. I do have a math example. Um, so I have three lines here. Now, if you have students who are colorblind, you might wanna label these lines or you might wanna do it anyways, um, instead of using the red, green, and blue. So you could label it, you know, line A, line B, or line C, or if you really wanna get fancy, you could label them, you know, this is Phil. This is Ted, this is Gwen. Um, but what you want to do here is this is a lesson on slope. And so you would say, here are three lines. Here are three lines. Which line is y equals x? Which line is y equals 2x? And which line is y equals 4x? And you could have them type into the chat box, public or private, depending on where you are in the lesson and, and what you feel would be best, which line is which. And for all my math majors who are just dying to do it, sure, go ahead, type it into the chat box. But that's not the reason why I'm showing you this image here, because we've already seen how to do the chat box. That's nothing new. What I want to show you here is how you can actually use annotate to have your students answer these questions. Now in Zoom, there is an annotate feature, and there may eventually be an annotate feature for Google Meets, but at the moment there isn't. So I have a workaround for you. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna go back to that Google Classroom. And when we go back to that Google Classroom, uh, let me, one second, pull it up. By the way, I would not recommend having like a million different screens when you're actually teaching your class. That is not the most efficient way to do it. But uh, for this training, um, I am going to have to toggle between the two. Um, and when we go to the Google Classroom under Classwork, we are now going to go to the Jamboard. So I want everyone to go under Classwork and select the AT Training Jamboard. If you haven't used Jamboard before, it is effectively a digital whiteboard, an interactive whiteboard. So you can change the background. I have a graph paper background right now, but you can make different ones. And you have features like the pen and they can select, change their color and, and you know, use that. Um, you can have them add sticky notes you can have them add images, you can have them add shapes and text, things of that nature. What I want you to do right now is I want everyone to grab the pen, grab the pen, 
And I want you to, with the pen, mark or circle which line is y equals x. Okay, refreshing. By the way, one other thing I've noticed about Jamboard is it does not like Safari, so I would recommend using Google Chrome. I could not get this image downloaded with Safari. All right, now people are annotating. There we go. All right, so I'm seeing some people circling the green line. I'm seeing some people circle the red line. All right, so now I can sort of see where my students are at. Right now you are all marked as anonymous. You could have your students name themselves, sign into the Google account and name themselves. You could see who is who. Um, so now I can call on a student and ask them, all right, which line did you circle and why? So here we're using the annotate feature in order to um, have the students answer those questions. So you can use the chat, you can use public or private, and you can also use the annotate feature. And my, my family decided to join me, so that was the fun part right there. All right. Um, so, um, like I said, Zoom has a whiteboard. Google Meets does not. I'm not sure about Microsoft Teams. So if that is the case, then you can use one of these Jamboards or a similar software in order to have the students annotate at the same time. All right. So now, yeah, I know you're having fun with that. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to close that down. You guys are having too much fun with the Jamboard. Your students will too. It's a lot of fun for them to doodle and scribble all over it. And again, you could use that for things like, um, actually, let me go back to that and show you again. My apologies, my son is very sad. He wanted to join us for this training. So if you hear him in the background, he says, but I wanted to use the Jamboard. All right, and perhaps the jelly board too. Okay, so um, another thing is that, how did I get this image here? So I took a screenshot and I uploaded this image. This is from Desmos, we'll show this a little bit later. But again, I could upload say that DNA picture, put it on the Jamboard and say circle where is the bond. You know, I could take um, any image that I'm working on from that PowerPoint and stick it up there and make it annotatable for my students. So again, to add that visual component. Or you could just have a whiteboard and use it like a whiteboard and have them just scribble and draw and mark up all over it. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Instead of like how you mentioned, like going back and forth from the Jamboard or Google Classroom or your PowerPoint all together, is there a way to like embed everything in your PowerPoint to link so it'll take it directly to Google Classroom and Jamboard? Absolutely, and um, that would be the preferable way to do it. So there's really two ways that I would recommend doing that. One is take your PowerPoint. So the PowerPoint that I have, I'm going to upload it at the end of this presentation so you'll have access. Turn it into a Google slide, embed everything in there, and then everything's already on your Google Classroom. The other thing you can do is with Google Classroom is you can actually turn them all into Nearpods and Nearpods will actually also have them embedded as well. Uh, if your teacher is a big Nearpod fan, um, they will show you how to use Nearpod. Um, some of the functionality is very good with Nearpod, some of it isn't. So, you know, they'll show you what works well and what doesn't. Um, but that absolutely is an option. And if I were to do this with my students, I would absolutely have it as a Google slide where everything is clicked and embedded. And the reason why I'm not doing that right now is I wanted to show you what these look like in the Google Classroom. So that way you could see, you know, when you're creating assignments, quizzes, questions, materials, how they would show up for you as a teacher. Um, so I'm trying to, to do a lot right now. I'm trying to show you as a student and as a teacher. And so it's not the best way to do this presentation. But when you're doing it with your students, absolutely just have a Google slide or a Nearpod for each lesson and then have everything embedded so everything's just clicked right in there and you're not having to toggle back and forth or toggle back and forth minimally throughout the lesson. Other questions? Okay. I, I asked a question in the chat. What is the limit that we can have for this uh, uh, Jamboard? I don't know. Um, I know there is. I know that, like you saw, it does not like 
a lot of people and that might change. A lot of these software programs are updating to deal with the fact that um, they were never designed to be used as the primary learning tool. They were always designed to be used as sort of supplemental by a lot of these you know, teachers. So um, I'm not sure at the moment what the number is. If somebody knows, please answer that. Oh, 16. I think it's 50 people. Okay. So if your class is bigger than that, you might want to use something else. Or, I mean, you could just use a Google slide. You could just use a Google slide and have them annotate through the Google slide. That would work as well. Um, or you could set up two jam boards, you know, and just split your class and say, okay, you get this one or you get that one. And we'll talk a little bit about breakout rooms later. You could have a jam board per breakout room. And so each breakout room, small group could get their own jam board and work on them. That would be another option. All right. Ooh, Ms. Goldberg, so, I sent you a message in the chat. Thanks. Yes. Okay. We are going to be going a little bit over. My apologies. Um, but I do want to show you a few more things that I think are going to make your classes really interactive and definitely benefit your students. So the next one we're gonna be talking about is um, manipulatives. So here's the thing about manipulatives. Manipulatives are awesome, they're great. You hand the students some manipulatives, they learn all this cool stuff. Hard to do when you're online, but impossible, no. So I'm gonna show you how to do manipulatives. So now what we're going to do is we're gonna go back to that Google Classroom and you are gonna pull up the What is Life card sort. If you had step one um, with Mr. Sears, Mr. Elizondo, and myself, you've probably done this activity before where you are going to sort the cards into three categories, living, non-living, and undecided if you're not sure. It's going to look something like this. You're gonna have a card deck. You are gonna select the item and you are going to move it to the correct category. So what we're gonna do right now is we are going to go to the Google Classroom and again, you would embed this into your presentation so you're not having to toggle back and forth. And you are going to open up the What is Life card sort PowerPoint. And you will open it up with Google Slides. Like I showed you, Nearpod is an option. Um, I did not use Nearpod for this. Nearpod does not have a drag and drop. So you would want to use Google Slides when you are doing something that has a drag and drop. Um, Nearpod has some other things you could do, like matching games, which could work. Uh, but for a simple drag and drop, you would want to use uh, Google Slides or PowerPoint. Now, here's the cool thing about Google Classroom. I do not want to give, all the things that I've given you so far have been to everyone. Like everyone has access. I do not want to do that when it comes to uh, this activity because if I give everybody access, Brianna moves one card and then Isaac moves it over. And then she moves it back and then he moves it over and then they're fighting over who's moving that car. So I wanna make sure every single student has their own set of manipulatives so only they are playing with it. So what I would recommend doing with that case is when you set up an assignment with Google Classroom, you can set it that everybody gets it or that every student gets their own copy. And it will make a copy for every student in your class. I could send this to you as a PowerPoint, and that's what I've done in the past, um, is just everyone downloads the PowerPoint and you manipulate the cards. The only issue with that is that as a teacher, I can't see what you're doing. So the benefit of the Google Slide and using the Google Classroom is that I can look at everybody's screen and see how they're manipulating the cards. So as they're working, we I can, you know, figure out which students might need a little bit more help and which ones are doing just fine. I can also ask specific students questions based off what they've done. Um, JB, would you mind sharing your screen um, where you have the Google slide? And so in order to do that, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set my screen share that multiple participants can share. If you'll go down to the bottom of the Zoom, there's a green screen share button. If you'll please click that and then share your screen. Excellent. Okay, so JB, just tell us about one of the items that you put under the living and why you put it there. Um, I put plants, animals, or oh, just one item, the baby. Why the baby? Well, because we know the baby is a living thing. Why? Why is it a living thing? Give me, give me a reason. Well, it, 
lives, breathes, eats, learns. Okay, so those would all be things that I might want to type down into my chat or that I might want to put into my Google Classroom. Um, you know, okay, he mentioned breathing, eating, learning. Um, and so I would say, okay, so these are characteristics of life that JV has just mentioned to the class. Now, um, let me give somebody else look at something that's non-living. So Crystal, can you unmute your mic and tell us, uh, pick something that you put under the non-living. The bicycle. The bicycle. And, and tell me, according to JV's definition, why would the bicycle not be living? So I would consider the bicycle non-living because, I mean, it doesn't breathe, it doesn't move, it doesn't, well, I mean, it moves, Ooh, but other it moves. persons. Oh, so that's tricky. It moves. So is it alive because it moves? No, not so necessarily. Should we keep move on our list or should we take move off our list? Maybe we could rephrase it to, um, I'm not sure. If somebody help out Crystal, what could we rephrase it to? We don't like move because bicycles move and babies move. But bicycles aren't alive and babies are alive. So give me something other than move. Who's got a good suggestion? Transportation. Transportation would be a better word or not a better word? Better. It sounds good to me. Okay, does somebody have an argument against transportation? I think it's too general. Too general. Maybe independently moving? Independently yes. moving. Do we like that one better? Yes. Wait, as good or bad? As, as a good suggestion. So we, we don't like moving because bicycles can move, but they're not alive. So we have independently moving. Do we like that one? Yes. All right, but what about the tree? Does there, it yeah, move? there are things not alive that yeah. move independently. Mm. I was about to say, I was like, that one. Okay, so we're not quite convinced about independently moving. The bike has to be manipulated to move. It can't just move and the okay. baby moves. Physically, like. Well, actually, like certain plants and trees will yeah, grow according to where the light is. So they'll move like their branches and shoots. So they could yeah. move like actually. Hmm. Tricky. How about, let's just delete that one, ma'am. <laughs> just take it all off. All right, so what we're doing right here is exactly what I want you to do with your students. Give them that opportunity to manipulate the cards and then have this conversation. And as you're having it, you could have them move their cards around. Um, okay, maybe we don't want that one here. Maybe we want that one there. Maybe we should add, maybe we should take away. Again, adding those annotations, that kind of running class list as we go through. But the other thing that I really wanted to show here was I don't have to be the one who always shares my screen. Who's sharing their screen at this point? JB. JB. Exactly. A, a student. A student can share their screen. So use that feature as well. All of them will allow your students to share their screen. Sometimes you might want to turn that off. But um, for the most part, that can be a really great learning tool. Again, using those visuals, not just the visuals I create, but the visuals the students create, where they can share their screen with the class and then have these conversations about, well, why did you move the cards over here? And then we could have somebody else share their screen and say, oh, but they moved the card over there. So let's see, where does that card belong? Where would be the better place for it? So again, that could be a way to make it, uh, the manipulatives very interactive. It's not just have them do the manipulative, but then have them share their screens with each other and compare their results. All right, so at this point, I'm going to end your screen share, JB. Sorry, it's mine now. Okay. Um, so questions um, about, oh, actually one more thing I wanna share with manipulatives before we go there, is to embed your manipulatives into your worksheets. So here I have the tables and chairs activity. I want them to figure out a pattern of how many chairs go with each table. So I actually have in this Google slide, I actually have the table where they can answer these questions, but then I have the manipulatives right here where I can have them pull up chairs and pull up tables 
and use those manipulatives as they answer the questions. And then they can start typing in what patterns do they see, what equations do they come up with. So you can use the manipulatives within your worksheets so that they can use both simultaneously on the same slide to help aid in their learning, just like they would in a physical classroom. You're just making a digital version of this. And again, you can do this in a PowerPoint and then transfer it over to a Google slide or transfer it to a Nearpod, or you can build them directly into the Nearpod or directly into the Google slide, whatever your preferred platform is. So questions at this point about manipulatives. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna put into the chat um, another, this is really great mostly for my math people. If you go to the Facebook group, Teaching with Neons, they actually, oh, that was a private chat. Sorry, let me send that to everybody. Teaching with Neons, they actually have created, teachers have created a ton of math manipulatives for you, and they are willing to share them for free. So you do not have to create a bunch of math manipulatives. They will already be created for you, and you are welcome to use them. There are some science ones too, but they're just not as good as the math ones. The math ones really are the better, but check them out. See if you find some good science ones, feel free to use them. And remember, you are all working together. You are all in this together. You're all probably doing the same curriculum around the same time. So if you come up with a really cool manipulative, please share it with your other ATs. I'm sure they would love to have it. And so, you know, use each other as a really good resource bank. Not everyone has to create every single manipulative from scratch. You can work with each other in team um, lesson plan, so that way you can divide and conquer and make your lessons really rich and really interactive. Yes, Alejandra, that group is amazing. They are so nice. They uh, put all their lessons for free, so everybody can use any manipulatives that they've created completely for free. Uh, just remember to give credit to who you got it from. You know, that, that's the important thing is to always cite your sources. All right, so other questions about manipulatives. What if you do not have Facebook? Um, well, I think the Facebook group is where you get them, but the platform isn't run through Facebook. So I think, you know, if, if somebody could send you the link to the actual site, you could probably still utilize the, the group. All right, so the next one I wanna talk about is demos. So just like we would do demos in our classrooms, you can do demos online. And you sort of have a couple different ways that you can do demos. One is you could show a pre-made video, just like you would normally in your classroom. So here I'm doing this chemistry lesson, and I want to show that um, how alkalized metals react with water. So I can pull up a video, and I can have them show, let me put that on mute, um, what happens when I put these alkali metals in water and ask the students questions as they're going. I would actually always recommend putting your videos on mute so that way you can ask questions as you're running through. So what do we notice about this one? What's happening? Color All right, change. type it into the chat. Type it into the chat. Again, just like with your students, no one's responding. So type it into the chat. Oh, now we added our second alkali metal. How is it different? Predictions, pause, predictions. What is gonna happen when we add that third alkali metal? Look at what happened with the first one. Look what happened with the second one. What's going to happen with the third one? All right, I'm seeing some predictions. It will change to purple. There will be a chemical reaction. It will change faster. All right, it will react more. Oh, look at that. Don't do that at home. Okay, that was pretty cool, right? That was fun. That was fun. Okay, so just like you would show a video in your class, you can show a video here. Again, use best practices, pause, ask questions, have students predict as the video runs through. You can also create your own video. So this is one I got off of uh, Google, but you can make your own video and do kind of the flip classroom where you sort of video record yourself uh, talking about a topic. I would recommend Flipgrid works really well, but you can use other platforms and have the students watch it and then you can refer back to it throughout class. But you can also demo in real time. Remember, you have that camera so they can see you. So you can take things from your house, some kitchen chemistry stuff, and you say, hey, here's a glass of water. Here's some food coloring. Let's talk about diffusion. 
predictions. What's going to happen when I add the food coloring? What's going to happen? Okay. Vanessa Galvan, what's going to happen when I add the food coloring? What do you think? Unmute yourself. What do you think is going to happen? When we pour in? Yeah. We'll see a change of color, or if not, no color. Okay, we will see a change in color. All right, here it is. Whoa! Demo in real time. And they can see, yes, yeah, she's correct. There is a change in color, but look at how it's moving. Do you think it would move differently if I heated the water? If I cooled the water? Type your predictions into the chat box. What would happen if I heated the water? What would happen if I cooled the water? And then guess what? I can get a glass of hot water. I could get a glass of cold water. And they could all see it using my camera. Very fancy. So there you go. So don't be afraid to do some demos in real life. They don't have to all be videos. You have a camera, you can use it. And you can just grab some stuff around the house and use those demos to show things you want your students to see. You can also have your students do the same thing. Students love show and tell. Go grab something from your house. That's a triangle. Now, let's talk about how to find area and perimeter. Great. So feel free to do things like that with your camera. Questions about demos? All right, so the next one we're gonna talk about is simulations. Simulations are actually fantastic for online learning because they were designed for online learning from the get-go. So there are several simulations that are out there. Here are three of my favorite. Um, you, there are way more. Your teachers will have recommendations. You can find some. But the nice thing about them is that they're designed for online learning. So every student pulls up the demo, they work on the demo, and then you can use the screen share where they can show each other or show the class how they've been working on that simulation, what results they've gotten, what they've seen. So I'm going to pull up some of these simulations right now, and I would highly recommend um, you utilizing them because they are some really great ones. Um, this first one, if you haven't seen it before, is Desmos graphing calculator. You can type in any equation you like, boom, makes the line for you or can make different uh, coordinates on there. You can zoom in, zoom out, you can uh, look at different points. You can make different lines and have the students compare, kind of like what we talked about with that slope. And like I said, you can also take screenshots of these, put them into a Jamboard, put them into a Google slide, and let your students just annotate all over them. So this is a really great um, online graphing calculator that you can utilize with your students. Another one that I really like is HHMI Biointeractives. They have tons of fantastic biointeractives. One of my favorites is the Virus Explorer. If you haven't used this one yet, your students are going to be interested in viruses. I wonder why. Um, so they unfortunately do not have COVID. They do not have coronavirus. Oops, clicked the wrong one. Uh, because um, when this one was developed, coronavirus wasn't, I mean, it was still a thing, but it wasn't everything. Um, so it wasn't the big virus that they were focusing on. But they do have other viruses you can compare based off host. You can compare based off genome type, and you can click on the virus and look inside it, look on the outside, and come up with some really cool questions, some really cool interactive lessons that you can do with this one. And so I would recommend if you're, you're one of my science people, check out HHMI, Biointeractives. They might even have a few math ones in there too. And then there's the oldie but the goodie fat. Gotta love FET. They've got great uh, simulations for bio, for chem, for physics, for math, um, all grade levels. And a lot of teachers have supplied for free pre-made lesson plans. So you can utilize those lesson plans and utilize those simulations. So those are three of my favorites, but there's plenty others that you can use that are great. And again, you are a community. Work together. If you find a really great simulation software, please share it with your classmates. Questions about the simulations? Okay, so we're gonna recap right now, and then we'll talk a little bit about breakout rooms. So get the most out of your class. Chat. We talked about the private chat, we talked about the public chat, utilize both. And when you have the chat, it's a great starting ground. It lets everybody answer. The private chat is really good if they're a little bit unsure, if they're not very confident in their answers or their spelling or their slow typers. 
But in addition to the chat, you do want to let your students unmute their microphones so they can still have that conversation. Share screen. You can share your screen with the students. They can share their screen with you. So that can make your lessons more interactive. And again, utilize those visuals very, very well. Um, when you're sharing the screen, you can also use annotate features so that you can mark up all over it and so they can see specific things that you want them to look at. And finally, we're going to talk about breakout rooms. So here's the thing about breakout rooms. Google Meets does not have breakout rooms yet. They are coming, but they will be coming. Um, yes, you'll get a break in just a minute. Uh, they are coming um, later. So here is the hack if you wanna do a breakout room with Google Meets. Now, again, I've never tried this. So if it, try it before you try it with the students to make sure it works. You create, so the difference between Zoom and Google Meets is that with Zoom, you can only have one Zoom running at a time. With Google Meets, you can have multiple. So you make a different link for every uh, breakout room you want to a different Google Meet. Then you have a hyperlink board where your students click on their group and it will take them to that specific Google Meet. You will want to set it to start on mute so you don't hear everybody at once, okay? Then you can go to the different Google Meet rooms and check in on the students. So that is your hack if you're using Google Meet to create a breakout room, okay? Does it work? I hope, I've never tried it but it should work in theory <laughs> try it out yourself before you do it with the students is there a video that i can watch like on youtube that shows that um the person who told me this hack is my sister so i will ask her and i can get back to you and see if she has something she's also been creating videos for her campus um so if she has a video that she's already created i can share that with the group okay. um the one thing that i would suggest when you're doing breakout rooms is assign roles. It's very easy for the students when they're in their breakout rooms to get off task. So assign at minimum these three roles, reporter, recorder, and timekeeper. Reporter will report back out when you all join together. Recorder will keep a record of your notes, what they've been talking about in the breakout room, and timekeeper will keep track of the time. Then when you have them in their breakout room, you need to have some sort of wiki. You need to have some sort of living document where you can see what they're working on. Otherwise, you're going to be flying blind. That can be a Google slide, a Google doc, um, uh, the poll everywhere, something where they are recording so you can see which groups are getting it and which ones aren't and who needs your help. So I will show you an example of that. I have this Google doc set up in your classroom. Um, do, do, do. There we go. So under classwork, here is an example of a breakout room Google Doc. Hopefully it will let me in. How about just I click this one? There we go. <laughs> so that way we don't run into that issue. So here I have the questions I want them to answer. I have my rooms numbered and everybody puts their name in the group that they're in and answers the questions. Oh, I'm so sorry. My apologies. Thank you. Okay, so I have the questions. Here I have the roles. I have the questions that I want them to answer while they're in, the, in their breakout rooms. They can put their team members. I have the rooms numbered. I also have made this a, a hyperlink document so it's easy for me to, to move between the rooms. So I can just click them on the side. And I can see what they're writing. If I notice group one isn't writing anything, maybe I should go visit that room. If I notice that group two has got it, they're good. All right, I don't have to visit them right away. If I notice group three is writing stuff, but it's kind of wrong, maybe I should go visit group three. That way you're not flying blind. Same thing with the Google Slides. You can see who's working, who's getting it, who needs your help. So always have some sort of wiki available with the breakout rooms so you know who to visit and who needs your help, okay? Oh, another thing, this is just a cool hack that I uh, found when I was um, making data tables like this. And it doesn't have to be a data table. It can be whatever format you like. Um, to, in order to get the titles to go onto the next page, put them in the header. So clever. And it'll go onto the next page. I thought that was a cool hack. 
there you go. All right, so that right there, we would normally practice the breakout rooms, but we are already way over time. And so I know you guys need a break. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just go back to my PowerPoint real fast. And we're gonna come back to this question. Can you teach inquiry remotely? What do you think? Type it into the chat. Sure. Unmute your microphone. Tell me. Yes, I'm getting an enthusiastic. Yes. There we go. You absolutely yes. can. Yes, we can. saw a bunch of True. awesome lessons in step one and CI and PBI at step two last semester where students taught remotely. It was awesome. It was great. There was so much learning. You can do this with your students. You absolutely can. So the full presentation, which is misspelled, will be available on that Google Classroom. You will have access to that Google Classroom if you want to see any of the other examples that I provided you. And if you have any questions about teaching inquiry online, please do not hesitate to email me or ask me. I am happy to help and utilize each other. You are all going through this together. You are all learning together. You all will figure out great things together. So utilize each other as resources as you navigate through this semester. All right. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, please let me know.